Charlemagne's imperial coronation on Christmas Day 800 was a pivotal event of his reign and the event for which he would most be remembered. For the first time in more than 300 years, a ruler in Western Europe held the imperial title. Perhaps even more importantly, Charlemagne's new title suggested a possible future in which Europe consisted not of multiple and independent kingdoms, but rather of a single and unitary empire, much like the Roman Empire at its height. Because Charlemagne staked his claim to single unitary rule, and because Charlemagne's court poets bestowed on him the title of Father of Europe, Charlemagne would become a symbol of European identity and unity. So how did this audacious idea come about? It emerged as the consequence of developments stretching back almost three centuries as Charlemagne's people, the Franks, rose to European prominence. It emerged, too, because Charlemagne's grandfather and father had made the Carolingians the preeminent Frankish family. And lastly, it emerged because Charlemagne's own life as heir apparent and then king positioned him to assume the imperial title at the age of 52. Historians continue to make discoveries about Charlemagne and his life. If I had been presenting Charlemagne's story in the mid-1970s or any time before that, I would have told you that Charlemagne was born in 742, give or take a year. The basis for my assertion would have been Einhard, who wrote that Charlemagne had been 72 years old at the time of his death in 814. However, in the 1970s, scholars re-examining the contemporary evidence for Charlemagne's birth and the activities of Charlemagne's parents posited that Charlemagne must have been born five years later in 747. Einhard had made Charlemagne several years older than he actually was. Then, in the 1990s, scholars realized that identifying Charlemagne's birth year as 747 failed to take into account that our sources' authors calculated years differently than we do. So the date of Charlemagne's birth became the second day of April, 748. The place of Charlemagne's birth is still uncertain, but it was somewhere in the kingdom of the Franks, and he himself was a Frank. The English word Frank, meaning honest, and before that free, is derived from the name of Charlemagne's people. The Franks were a Germanic people, one of many that had entered the western half of the Roman Empire in the 4th and 5th centuries. Like other Germanic peoples, the Franks had established their own independent territories and kingdoms within the western half of the Roman Empire. The person with the best claim to have been the first king of the Franks was Clovis, who died in 511. Thanks to the name Clovis, French and German history would be filled with figures named Louis and Ludwig, both names derived from Clovis. Clovis and then his Frankish subjects converted to the Catholic variant of Christianity. The Franks' conversion likely facilitated Frankish rule over the Catholic Gallo-Roman population. The Frankish kingdom gradually expanded until by the early 8th century it encompassed most of what had once been Roman Gaul. During that expansion, multiple linguistic divides began to emerge among the Franks. Those Franks living in northeastern regions along the Rhine River Valley and thereabouts continued to speak Frankish, a Germanic language. Everywhere else, Franks began to speak a form of Latin that evolved into Old French. The Franks' own Germanic language influenced the newly emerging Old French language, with the influence stronger in the north than in the south. The influence often took the form of loan words. Modern French has perhaps 1,000 loan words that came from Frankish and pushed out Latin alternatives. These linguistic borrowings give us some sense of what the Franks were doing and of how others perceived the Franks. The loan words often involve war and conflict. For example, the Latin word for war was bellum, but the French word today is guerre, which is quite different and of Frankish origin. 
The Latin word for arrow was sagita, but the French word is the Frankish flesh. On a lighter note, the Franks also brought a new word for crayfish, which gave the French their écrevisse. It seems most likely that Charlemagne's native tongue was Germanic Frankish, a language in which he took a scholarly and literary interest. At the same time, though, considering the western places where he spent much of his youth and where he traveled, it seems likely that he could converse in Old French. The Frankish kingdom founded by Clovis soon became kingdoms plural. According to the Frankish system of succession, when a king died, that king's lands were divided among male heirs. These male heirs received royal titles. Descended from Clovis, they belonged to the dynasty that he had established, the Merovingian dynasty, named for a mythical ancestor. This system of dividing the kingdom, known as partible inheritance, left the Frankish territory in a state of constant flux, Kingdoms proliferated and consolidated, expanded and contracted. At the time of Charlemagne's birth, the Frankish kingdoms included most of what is present-day France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, plus parts of present-day Germany. When Charlemagne was born on the 2nd of April, 748, there was no reason to think that he would ever be king of the Franks, much less an emperor. Charlemagne's family, the Carolingians, were not yet the Franks' ruling dynasty. The Merovingian dynasty, which Clovis had founded, still ruled, as had been the case for more than two centuries. But Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, and then his father, Pepin, had become de facto rulers among the Franks. They took over the actual operations of the Frankish government and edged the Merovingian kings into irrelevance. Charles Martel led the Franks in battle against Arab raiders in 732, winning a victory that burnished the Carolingians' reputation for effective leadership. In 751, when Charlemagne was about three years old, his father Pepin deposed the last Merovingian king and himself became sole king of the Franks, Rex Francorum. He did so with papal approval. Pope Zachary approved the deposing. That pope's successor, Stephen II, then anointed Pepin as king in 754. The pope anointed Pepin in Francia itself, specifically at Saint-Denis near Paris. It was the first ever papal visit north of the Alps. The newness of Carolingian rule must be kept in mind when studying Charlemagne. He and his family were upstarts. Many of Charlemagne's contemporaries could remember a time when his family had not ruled. Charlemagne and the Franks had many neighbors with whom to contend. To the Franks' southwest was the Iberian Peninsula, with its small Christian kingdoms in the mountainous north, and Al-Andalus, as its Arabic-speaking rulers called it, comprising the rest. Al-Andalus was well on its way to becoming a predominantly Muslim and predominantly Arab-speaking part of Europe, ruled by, if not always controlled by, the Emir of Cordoba. Al-Andalus was also wealthier and much more urbanized than Charlemagne's own lands. To the Franks' northwest, Brittany, rural, Celtic-speaking, and hard to control, notwithstanding Charlemagne's claims to be its overlord. To the northeast, Frankish rule extended beyond the Rhine River, but not by much. Beyond the Frankish toehold on the east bank of the Rhine were various pagan and Germanic tribes, whom the Carolingians called the Saxons. It's not entirely clear what the Saxons would have called themselves at this point. Beyond the Saxons were still more pagans, including the Danes and a multitude of Slavic tribes. Farther south, between the Rhine and Danube rivers, Frankish rule included Bavaria, but to the east of Bavaria, in what is today Hungary, was the Avar Empire. The Avars were most likely the descendants of Central Asian nomads, and they had ruled this area around the Danube River since the 6th century. 
Italy and the Italian peninsula were politically fractured. Northern Italy was seat of the Lombard kingdom. The Lombards, like the Franks, were a Germanic people. They had ruled Northern Italy for almost 200 years. Central Italy was papal territory, seat of the recently emerged Republic of St. Peter. Southern Italy was more or less under the control of the Byzantine Empire, although local dukes, such as the Duke of Benevento, sometimes enjoyed something close to independence. That is a long list of neighbors, but they all have one thing in common. Aside from the papal-ruled Republic of St. Peter, Charlemagne fought them all, each and every one of them. Charlemagne's father, Pepin, had groomed Charlemagne for rulership during Charlemagne's youth. When Pope Stephen traveled to Francia for the purpose of anointing Pepin as king in 754, Pepin sent Charlemagne, who was then about six years old, to meet the Pope en route and to escort him for the rest of his journey. During the anointing ceremony, the Pope anointed not only Pepin, but also Pepin's wife and their two sons, Charlemagne and Carloman. When Charlemagne was 13, his father took him on his first military campaign. Thereafter, Charlemagne commonly participated in his father's campaigns. In the early 760s, while Charlemagne was in his teens, Pepin put a monastery and some unnamed counties under Charlemagne's jurisdiction, and also had Charlemagne confirm a charter. These experiences prepared Charlemagne for what he would have to do one day as a king. Charlemagne's brother, Carloman, was about three years younger than Charlemagne. Pepin groomed Carloman for future rulership in exactly the same way that he groomed Charlemagne. In keeping with Frankish practice, Pepin intended to divide his kingdom equally between his two sons, each of whom would be a king. And when the time came, Pepin followed through on that intention. In 768, Pepin sensed correctly that he did not have long to live, and he arranged for each of his sons to marry a Frankish woman with an aristocratic background. Charlemagne's wife, his first one, was Himmeltrude. When Pepin died in 768, Charlemagne and Carloman received their kingdoms. Charlemagne's consisted of a long but skinny crescent-shaped arc of land beginning in Aquitaine in southwestern France, stretching up along the coasts of the Atlantic Ocean and the English Channel, and then into the Rhine River Valley. Carloman's kingdom was a large, solid blob, contiguous with Charlemagne's kingdom. Under the Merovingians, the partitioning of a kingdom often touched off wars between disgruntled heirs. In 768 and the years immediately afterward, history looked as though it was going to repeat itself. Charlemagne and Carloman did not like each other. Their mother, Bertrada, tried to keep her lines of communication open with each son. She also orchestrated some complex and opaque diplomatic maneuvers. Charlemagne's first wife had already given birth to a male son, yet Bertrada prevailed upon Charlemagne to dismiss his first wife and to marry instead a daughter of Desiderius, king of the Lombards. What Bertrada hoped to accomplish by persuading Charlemagne to dismiss his first wife and to marry the daughter of the Lombard king is not clear. We don't even know the name of Charlemagne's new Lombard wife. Whatever the motive, the move outraged the Pope, not because Charlemagne was now a bigamist, which he was, but because his new wife was a Lombard. Back in 754, Pope Stephen II had anointed Pepin as king of the Franks in return for Frankish military campaigns against the Lombards. Pepin had then allotted to the papacy central Italian lands that the Franks had wrested from the Lombards a foundational moment in the creation of the papal state. Now, 12 years later, the Franks and the Lombards seem to be drawing closer together and isolating the papacy. Meanwhile, Charlemagne and Carloman edged closer to war with each other. At his accession as king, Charlemagne faced resistance in Aquitaine. Carloman refused to help Charlemagne to quell the resistance, 
and Charlemagne seems to have retaliated by shoving Carloman out of Aquitaine entirely. Then, suddenly and unexpectedly, Carloman died of natural causes at the age of around 20. Immediately, the succession of Carloman became a pressing and contested issue. He had already fathered two sons by his wife, Gerberga. Some within Carloman's kingdom pledged their support to those children. Others within Carloman's kingdom, though, pledged their support to Charlemagne. Gerberga and her two children fled to Italy and placed themselves under the protection of Desiderius, king of the Lombards. It was around this time that Charlemagne dismissed his Lombard wife, who was Desiderius's daughter. Whether Charlemagne dismissed his Lombard wife because her father was protecting Charlemagne's nephews, or whether those nephews had fled to Desiderius because Charlemagne had already dismissed Desiderius's daughter is unclear. Charlemagne, still in his early 20s, faced the pivotal moment of his entire career. He had a chance to become the one and only king of the Franks. But to do so, he would have to overcome those Franks who supported his nephews, and he would have to fight against the Lombards. And to fight against the Lombards, he would need to convince the Franks to undertake a risky crossing of the Alps. Mountain passes could be dangerous. Charlemagne succeeded in winning Frankish support for an invasion of Italy. He and his Frankish followers gathered at Geneva in the summer of 773 and agreed to invade. Charlemagne split his army in two, likely to increase speed and to make provisioning easier. These divided marches would become one of Charlemagne's favorite maneuvers. The Franks made it through the Alps safely. Indeed, for reasons that are unclear, they encountered no resistance to speak of en route. The recombined armies besieged Desiderius in Pavia, the most important city within the Lombard kingdom. The siege lasted for nine months. During the siege of Pavia, Charlemagne learned that his sister-in-law Gerberga and his two nephews were not themselves at Pavia. They had taken refuge 130 miles east in Verona. Charlemagne and part of his army marched on Verona, where someone surrendered Gerberga and his nephews to Charlemagne. Even though he now had his sister-in-law and his brother's heirs in custody, Charlemagne continued with the siege of Pavia. Racked with disease, Pavia's defenders surrendered, and Lombard resistance melted away. In 774, Charlemagne took the title King of the Lombards and added it to his initial title, King of the Franks. He confined the deposed Lombard king Desiderius to a monastery in northern France, together with Desiderius' wife and likely the daughter who had briefly been Charlemagne's own second wife. Charlemagne's Lombard invasion had been a spectacular success. Not only had Charlemagne made himself the sole king of the Franks and taken possession of Carloman's kingdom, he had toppled the two-century-old Lombard kingdom in the process and made himself the ruler of northern Italy. As an added benefit, Charlemagne used his invasion of Italy to reassert the Carolingian dynasty's support for the papacy and to develop his own personal relationship with the Pope. Charlemagne traveled to Rome, the first of five visits that he would make there during his lifetime. He met with the recently consecrated Pope Hadrian I, who would remain Pope for more than two decades. And it is surely no coincidence that from 774 onward, Charlemagne began using the title Patrician of the Romans to supplement his other titles. What did it mean to be Patrician of the Romans? Nothing very specific, but the title established another conceptual link between Charlemagne and Rome. That link would continue to develop in future decades. As for what happened to Carloman's wife, Gerberga, and to Charlemagne's nephews, Frankish sources are silent on the matter. Einhard does not even mention that Carloman's sons were surrendered into Charlemagne's custody. We learn that information only from a papal source, the Liber Pontificalis. But even the papal source says not a word about what happened to Charlemagne's sister-in-law and nephews. 
How to interpret this absolute silence? Given the willingness of Frankish sources to tell us about Charlemagne consigning other prisoners to monasteries or to exile, it seems quite likely that Charlemagne had these prisoners murdered. Charlemagne's invasion of Italy and his war against the Lombards in 773 and 774 was just one of many wars that Charlemagne would fight in the decades prior to his imperial coronation. In most cases, he initiated those wars. In fact, as king of the Franks, he fought nearly every year. So rare was it for Charlemagne not to campaign that the royal Frankish annals specifically mentioned when in a given year he did not wage war against anyone. His victories doubled the size of his lands until they encompassed one million square kilometers, which is about 386,000 square miles. These campaigns required much travel on Charlemagne's part. During the space of a single year in 785 and 786, he traveled over 2,000 miles. Charlemagne waged war in a variety of locations and for a variety of reasons. Against the Bretons, whom Charlemagne considered to be his subjects, even if the Bretons disagreed, Charlemagne sent isolated punitive expeditions in 786, 799, and then again in 811. Against the Avar Empire, located in what is roughly present-day Hungary, Charlemagne himself led an expedition in 791, initiating the Avar War of 791 to 796. That war ended with Frankish victory and the despoiling of the Avars. Einhard himself regarded the Avar War as Charlemagne's second most important war, on account of how much loot the Franks captured. Einhard regarded Charlemagne's wars against the Saxons, initiated in 772 and concluded in 804 as his greatest. The long Saxon wars showcased Charlemagne's resilience and determination, and victory led to the eastward spread of Christianity. That Charlemagne attacked the Saxons in 772 might seem ill-advised considering that the fate of the Frankish kingdoms was at a critical juncture. Charlemagne's brother Carloman had died in 771. The Frankish invasion of northern Italy in 773 and 774 so that Charlemagne could gain control of his brother's heirs and kingdom was in the offing. In fact, though, Charlemagne's campaign focused on capturing and destroying a well-known Saxon shrine, the Irminsul, which had treasures associated with it. Those treasures seemed to have been Charlemagne's objective. With them, he could convince the Franks to support his expedition into Italy and underwrite the expedition itself. Following the conquest of the Lombard Kingdom, Charlemagne then continued the war against the Saxons, but turned it in a new direction. Saxony had multiple pagan tribes, wooden fortifications, and no towns to speak of. It was quite different from Lombard Italy with its walled cities and its ubiquitous vestiges of the Roman classical past. Having initially looted a Saxon shrine, Charlemagne then sought to bring about the Saxons' submission, as well as their baptism and Christianization. Charlemagne himself campaigned in Saxony in 775, and for the next decade the Franks slogged on against the Saxons. For their part, the Saxons repeatedly surrendered and accepted baptism only to renounce their surrender when the opportunity arose. Leaders of the Saxon resistance began to emerge, such as Wittekind in 777. In the face of Saxon recalcitrance, Charlemagne's tactics grew ferocious. In 782, at a place called Verden, Charlemagne executed 4,500 Saxons who had rebelled against him and then been turned over to him by other Saxons. We know about this massacre because the Royal Frankish Annals report it. And remember, the Royal Frankish Annals tell us what Charlemagne wanted us to know. Charlemagne's first capitulary for the Saxons, issued around the time of the massacre, established a penalty of death for Saxons who refused baptism or who ate meat during Lent or who committed any one of a number of other offenses. Charlemagne himself seems to have been dissatisfied with the results that such hardline tactics yielded. Over time, he moderated his approach somewhat. In 785, 
worn down by annual Frankish campaigns, Wittekind submitted to Charlemagne, who treated Wittekind more leniently than one might have expected. Charlemagne himself served as godfather at Wittekind's subsequent baptism, and Charlemagne let Wittekind return to his lands afterward. No monastic confinement, much less execution. Seven years of peace followed Wittekind's submission, but the Saxons rebelled in 792, taking advantage of turmoil elsewhere in Charlemagne's kingdom. Again, the Franks ground down Saxon resistance while also seeking to redress the grievances that fueled rebellion. A second Saxon capitulary issued circa 797 refrained from imposing the death penalty for religious infractions. Helping the Franks were a Slavic group, the Abitrites, whose victory against the Saxons in 798 set the stage for the war's end six years later. In 804, Emperor Charlemagne deported a large number of Saxons out of their homeland and into Francia, settling his Slavic Abitrite allies on the Saxons' lands. Saxon resistance, which had in fact been minimal for the last several years, finally ended. Not all of Charlemagne's military adventures went so well. His incursion into Spain in 778 went poorly for him, although later attempts to rewrite the story did give the world a remarkable poem. In 777, Arab ambassadors from Islamic Spain met with Charlemagne. They proposed that Charlemagne come to northeastern Al-Andalus, where the towns of Zaragoza and Barcelona and their governors would accept Charlemagne as their overlord. Why would these towns and governors do that? A little more than two decades earlier, a newly arrived outsider had taken power across most of Al-Andalus. He was Abd al-Rahman, and he was a member of the Umayyad dynasty, which had provided the caliphs of Damascus until the Abbasids overthrew them and moved the caliphate to Baghdad. Following the coup of 750 in Damascus, Abd al-Rahman had gone westward to Al-Andalus, where he became emir of Cordoba and claimed overlordship of Islamic Spain. The governors of Zaragoza and Barcelona had no great liking for the outsider who had come to rule them. So they turned to Charlemagne, who seemed strong enough to offer them protection, but distant enough to leave them in a state of de facto independence. Charlemagne accepted the offer. As with the Italian expedition, he divided his army into two groups. One traveled along the Mediterranean coast. The other, led by Charlemagne, traveled into Basque lands, crossed the Pyrenees, and made its way to the Basque town of Pamplona. The two Frankish armies were then rendezvous at Zaragoza. The march into Spain went without incident, but when Charlemagne and his armies reached Zaragoza, the town did not welcome him as he had expected that it would. Its governor had gotten cold feet about the whole plan. He refused to allow Charlemagne or his army into the town, and he refused to participate in the plot any longer. With little prospect for military success, Charlemagne and the Franks retreated northward. Passing by Pamplona, they either destroyed the town walls or sacked the town entirely. Either way, their actions would not have endeared them to the region's Basque inhabitants. As the Franks made their way through the Pyrenees, Basques ambushed Charlemagne's rearguard in a narrow pass near the village of Roncesvalles. The Basques pillaged Charlemagne's baggage train and killed some Franks important enough for the Frankish chroniclers to identify them by name. Egahard, Anselm, and Rodland, Count of the Breton March. Each of these individuals now had a one in three chance of achieving literary immortality by becoming the hero and namesake of an epic poem that will be written down some 300 years later. Apparently, though, the Song of Egahard just did not cut it, and neither did the Song of Anselm. The Song of Roland, on the other hand, became the most famous epic poem of the Middle Ages. The Frankish defeat in Spain was chastening. It would be another 20 years before Charlemagne tried anything in Spain again. But the very next year, he was back in Saxony campaigning. When Charlemagne began his Saxon wars in 772, he had been sole king of the Franks for barely a year. 
When he ended the Saxon Wars in 804, he ruled over territory whose size he had nearly doubled, and he was an emperor. In the next lesson, we will revisit Charlemagne's imperial coronation on Christmas Day 800, and we will explore how Charlemagne's life changed after he became an emperor.